owe us money? No. It's Even a, it's if it had been money for 6,000 years, somebody reversed that and eliminated that economic law. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's an asset. The biggest misconception about gold is that it's a speculative element. The biggest misconception is that gold is the cause of financial panics and was the cause of the Great Depression, and that's simply not true. People always compare gold to stocks. That's just nonsense. Well, the majority of people don't have any understanding about gold at all. The biggest misconception about gold is that it's no longer money. The idea that a bureaucrat, a president, uh, uh, could say in 1971 that gold is not money and therefore it isn't. After 4,000 years that the bureaucrats control money is an absurdity to anyone who studied history and understands economics. Gold is a financial asset which polarizes opinion like no other. To many, it represents the one true money. But whether you believe in it or not, gold has somehow outlasted every alternative currency for thousands of years. I'm Grant Williams, and in this series, I'm going to explain how and why gold became money, show you what it takes to find and produce an ounce of gold, and examine its place in the modern day financial system. We'll look at the history of the gold standard, show you how gold is bought and sold around the world, and you'll witness the extraordinary measures people take to keep it safe. When I'm done, I hope you'll have a better understanding as to exactly why this curious yellow metal has been the source of such fascination for mankind for thousands of years. Gold's place as money has run deep within the fabric of society since it was first discovered thousands of years ago. But how and why did this curious yellow metal find itself at the center of the financial universe? Gold has been money for 4,000 years. And one of the most fascinating things about that is that nobody knew why gold is money until about 100 years ago. Everyone just did it. Uh, the, the market, it was an emergent property of the market, but no one decided, uh, let's use gold. What the kings of Judea did not sit down and say, let's use gold. It just it came out of the market. The history of the world is the story of gold. So said Canadian billionaire Eric Sprott. Unique in its endurance and rarity, gold has been valuable throughout the history of mankind. When molten iron formed the Earth's core, it pulled most of the gold on the planet down with it. The gold in the Earth's core could make a 13-inch coating across the entire planet's surface, but of course it could never be recovered. For the earliest civilizations, gold was a store of value, a medium of exchange, as well as a thing of beauty. For the Egyptians, gold represented the sun, their gods, their rulers, and eternal life. The Incas described gold as the tears of the sun, and the Greek author Homer, in the Iliad and the Odyssey, saw gold as wealth for humans and the glory of the immortals. The first use of precious metals as money took place around 700 BC, with coins struck by the merchants of Lydia, which were actually formed from a naturally occurring mixture of gold and silver known as electrum. Gold's unique properties enabled the Templars to create the first banks in 13th century Europe, as people were able to store their gold in one bank and borrow against it elsewhere as they traveled across the continent. Gold's role as money and the universal acceptance of its value enabled mankind to build a vibrant economy that transcended both borders and cultures. It allowed new worlds to be discovered and settled and enabled trade to spread across the globe. But today, we find ourselves in the first period of human history in which no country on earth has a currency backed by gold. So why does gold retain its importance in the modern day financial system if it's no longer money? I would argue to begin with that gold is still money. It's one of many forms of money. It is a medium of exchange and a store of value, unlike other forms of money, including fiat currencies and cryptocurrencies. And in that context, the gold market trades billions of dollars a day. So to describe it as something other than money is a bit of a mistake. There was a point in time in certain societies when the only money was gold. We're past that point in time. Gold is a competing currency. It is, in fact, payment rather than a promise to pay. 
most money is a promise to pay rather than being payment in and of itself. Gold is extremely important because throughout history, gold is the only money that has survived. Throughout uh, centuries uh, and even you take 2,000 years back, governments have always destroyed the value of fiat money or paper money or silver money at the time of the Romans to the extent that it has become worthless. Gold is important today because it's a, it's a store of value. And in the moment, at the moment, we have a real dearth of reliable stores of value. I mean, if you can, if you can think of what gold represents that financial assets don't represent, for example, is it's scarce. It's independent. It's not anybody's obligation. It's not anybody's liability. It's not drawn on anybody. It doesn't require anybody's imprimatur to say whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, or to refuse to pay. It is what it is, and it's in your hand. So in, in a world where financialization and securitization has essentially converted a lot of things, even real estate, into securities, which are merely obligations, claims, uh, which are intermediated through multiple layers of financial uh, institutions, but there are times when they cannot be formed. The one thing that, that we have with gold is that it, you know, it can't be replicated, you know, by by turning on a, a well a, a printing press or, or or really adding a couple of zeros to a bank ledger. You can't print more of it, which makes it a better money. If it's not money, why does the U.S. have 8,000 tons? Why does the IMF have 3,000 tons? Why has Russia tripled its gold reserves in the last uh, 10 years? Why is China buying every piece of gold that's not nailed down and at the largest mining production in the world and zero exports? So the reasons why gold remains money are essentially the same as they've been for centuries. And while to many people's confusion, a lot of those reasons are based on faith, the idea of faith in a timeless physical asset which has proven its worth since the dawn of civilization is perhaps less confounding than the faith shown in the central bank governors of the modern day monetary system who can conjure trillions of fiat currency units out of thin air at will. But what was it about gold and silver which led to those two elements becoming money? Well, to answer that question, all we need is a periodic table and a big red marker pen. First of all, we can remove all the gases. Obviously, we can't use things like hydrogen or argon as money. Next, we can remove elements such as calcium and sodium, which dissolve in water, and also anything that reacts with air, whether it corrodes or bursts into flames, neither of which is a suitable thing to keep in your pocket. This removes 56 elements. Then, of course, we need to eliminate anything radioactive because, well, quite simply, you don't want your money to kill you. And perhaps surprisingly, this disqualifies 45 elements. Now, if you've been keeping up, that leaves us with just five so-called precious metals. Gold, silver, rhodium, platinum, and palladium. Neither rhodium nor palladium were discovered until the 18th century, so that rules them out as early money. And the problem with platinum is its melting point of around 3,000 degrees Celsius, which was far out of reach of mankind's earliest furnaces. All that leaves us is gold and silver, and it was these two precious metals which mankind adopted as both stores of value and mediums of exchange. Despite the fact that gold is no longer used as currency, its characteristics as a store of value remain untarnished. However, if you want to store a valuable asset, you have to do so in a way that protects it. To most people, storing gold is thought to be a cumbersome and expensive process, but the reality is somewhat different. So how do you buy gold? And once you do so, where is the safest place to store it? Gold has to be stored outside of the institutions against which it serves as insurance, or against the collapse of which, or the problems of which it serves as insurance. And obviously it has to be stored in a way where you personally have ability to access it. Many people, myself included, prefer to hold gold in secure storage, and they prefer to hold it outside the political jurisdiction in which they live, because they regard it as insurance, among other things, against the depredation of their own government. If it's physical, it's allocated and segregated, then you don't really care. It's then down to the quality institute that are holding it and the quality of their security measures that they have. While an individual can easily store up to half a million pounds of gold bullion in a simple safety deposit box, there are places in the world which are home to the gold which makes up the wealth of nations. And secret vaults, which house the gold that the planet's wealthiest individuals, chooses their means of preserving intergenerational wealth. 
One of those vaults is buried deep beneath the Swiss Alps. It's home to billions of dollars of privately held gold and has never before been filmed. But we were granted permission to take a look inside one of the world's most secretive locations to show you the lengths mankind will go to in order to keep this most precious of metals safe. So we're here today in the biggest private gold vault in the world. And here, gold is stored for wealthy families, for institutions, for private banks, and even for some central banks. When you come through this vault, you go through a number of security zones. You're deep in the mountain here. You, we've gone for miles or kilometers through various security zones and different levels deep in the Swiss mountain to reach actually where the gold is stored. It is the only vault in the world which is nuclear bomb proof, earthquake proof, gas attack proof, has a security level that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. I've lost count of how many doors I've gone through. I have no idea how far I've walked and I find myself in the middle of a mountain somewhere in Switzerland. And it's only when you get to a place like this that you understand the lengths that people go to to protect this yellow metal, the security you have to put in place, the things you have to do to keep it protected. This idea of the preservation of purchasing power is central to the notion of buying gold as a store of wealth. And it's been a proven strategy which has transcended history. As mankind has debased hundreds of paper currencies over the centuries, gold has remained as the anchor at the heart of the financial system. And the reasons for that are the unique properties which made it money in the first place. Gold's durability, portability, fungibility and divisibility have combined to make sure that it's maintained its purchasing power, outlasting every fiat alternative for almost 6,000 years. Through booms and busts, through war and famine, and through mankind's constant ability to debauch and devalue fiat alternatives. While the dollar has been the world's reserve currency for 40 years, that hasn't always been the case. The British pound, the Spanish peseta, and even the Portuguese escudo at one point in history were all as mighty in their time as the dollar is today. Throughout history, when civilizations needed to finance expansion, they were constrained by their gold reserves. The Romans physically clipped their coins, reducing the amount of gold and silver, and thereby reducing the wages paid to their armies, until such point that the soldiers refused to fight. For the majority of the last 200 years, the world has been on a gold standard of some sort. But we live in the first period in recorded history of a purely fiat currency regime. That regime began when Richard Nixon broke the dollar's link to gold in 1971. Today, the absence of any link to gold has allowed governments to increase debt to completely unsustainable levels. When society can no longer service this ever-expanding debt mountain, a return to a gold standard of some sort is almost inevitable. We've all lived in a purely fiat monetary system since Richard Nixon's supposedly temporary suspension of the dollar's convertibility into gold. And because of that, the idea of a return to a gold standard of some sort is seen as both unthinkable and unworkable. The gold standard has been blamed for the Great Depression, and many prominent politicians and economists have claimed that a gold standard would be impossible in today's world. The question is why? What was the gold standard? And why does the very idea of its reinstatement stir up such passion in the hallowed halls of governments and central banks? We had no central bank from 1836 to 1913. Uh, that was one of the greatest periods of prosperity in world history. Forget American history. I mean, invention, you know, the telephone, the, the reaper, the, the airplane, uh, uh, radio, phonograph, uh, massive increase electricity, massive increases in productivity, uh, great industrial uh, successes, Andrew Carnegie. So America grew like crazy with no central bank. First of all, it's voluntary. You as a nation could choose to be on it or not. Um, a lot of countries found it in their interest to do so. And all you had to do was say, okay, we, we print money, we have this paper money, but it's redeemable for gold at a fixed rate. And you sort of declared that, and that was your policy, and you stayed with it. Now, if a whole bunch of currencies are convertible to gold at a fixed rate, then through a simple transit of law, they're convertible into each other at a fixed rate. Um, 
And that was how the world worked, again, with no, no guidance from bureaucrats. And if you ran a trade uh, deficit, uh, you had to pay for that in gold. Well, what happened when you had to pay for that in gold? Well, you were decreasing your money supply. That was deflationary. Prices went down. Uh, wages might have gone down, for that matter. But that made you more competitive, and then you would come back to a trade surplus because all of a sudden you were the chief provider. Likewise, if you were running a trade surplus and you were getting all this gold, what happened? Your money supply increased. That was inflationary. Your prices went up. You were less competitive. So this was a self-equilibrating system. The gold standard was a method that tied the political classes and the voter to reality with regards to the construction of an economy untied to arithmetic. We've had a number of occasions when, when uh, a gold standard basically broke down, and, but it was never because of the system, never because of the gold. It's always been because of politicians breaking the gold standard. The gold standard didn't work because it didn't allow the spenders to plunder the savers. The politicians were, of course, instrumental in that. It wouldn't work today because the political class doesn't want any part of a system that constrains their power. There was an article, an editorial in the New York Times, actually, that they pointed in the 50s, that pointed out that it didn't fail, it was killed. It was killed by the uh, power, the Allied powers uh, because they wanted to fight war. Before World War I broke out, the, the, the uh, consensus was, the general consensus was that the war couldn't last more than a few months because there was, certainly wasn't enough money for the governments to fight the war. And of course, that, that view didn't understand the first thing the governments would do was cancel the right of redemption and print the money to fight the war. There were five people kind of in the room at Camp David that weekend. It was August 15th, 1971. Richard Nixon went up to Camp David with his you know, economic team. Uh, it, was, um, it was Paul Volcker, who was uh, Deputy Secretary of the Treasury at the time, um, Arthur Burns, who was um, Chairman of the Fed, uh, John Connolly, who was Secretary of the Treasury, uh, President Nixon, and there was a fifth man, and for many years I never knew who the fifth man was. I couldn't figure it out. It turned out to be a friend of mine, Kenneth Dam, was the, the Dean Emeritus of the University of Chicago Law School. I spoke to Volcker and I spoke to Ken Dam. So I spoke to two of the five people who were there most involved with the decision, and they all told me the same thing, which is, um, they really thought it was temporary. So a monetary system which had endured for thousands of years was terminated by the stroke of a president's pen. But what changed when Nixon shut the gold window, removing the dollar's anchor? And how has that affected the way we think of money today? The world changed tremendously after Nixon closed the gold window. Up until that point, uh, effectively, um, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, you had the Bretton Woods system where uh, the dollar uh, was uh, valued at $35, was tied to gold at $35 an ounce, and the rest of the world's currencies were tied to the dollar. And so what you had was a system where the dollar was effectively uh, as good as gold. They shut the gold window and they thought, well, let's get ready to reopen it tomorrow. Um, and, and see, you know, just, just in case everyone sort of, you know, there's a run on the dollar or, or you know, the people lose confidence in, in, the, in, the, in the monetary system, let's get ready to reopen the window pretty much immediately. So really he was sending up a balloon, you know, let's try this policy because we've really run out of money and the other option is, is to actually run a, a much tighter fiscal system. You see, it wasn't the actual fact of closing the window that, 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 that changed anything. It was the fact that everybody else accepted it. Right? If everybody had said, what, you know, dollar piece of paper, forget it, no. And the dollar, you know, collapsed or, you know, people stopped accept, accepting treasury bills, then, then we'd still have the gold, gold standard. But it's the apathy of, of the general population at large that caused um, or that allowed Nixon to get away with this, this, this change. If you think back to 1971 and decide whether on a global basis more people trusted Nixon or more people trusted gold, the circumstance where gold rose in dollar terms from $35 to $850 tells you something about the franchise enjoyed by Nixon and the franchise enjoyed by gold. So what really happened to gold? Nothing. What happened to the US dollar in the ensuing 40 years? catastrophic. The entire financialization of the system came about 
because of this soft default on, on, on US Treasuries that happened in 1970. Of course, it's a soft default because it was a temporary suspension of the, of the convertibility of the dollar, and i.e. they still owe that gold. So in, in common parlance, when Nixon uh, uh, abandoned the gold standard, as it's called, in August of 1971, the idea is that uh, gold stopped being money because the dollar wasn't tied to it. And there were people, people who thought gold would collapse without the monetary demand, gold would go away. It's absolutely crazy because, of course, it was the dollar's connection to gold that stabilized the dollar, not the other way around. So far in our journey, we've seen how and why gold became money. And over many centuries, gold has proven itself a far superior store of value than any fiat currency. But there's another story that needs telling. The story of mankind's relentless quest to find gold and extract it from increasingly difficult places, and then to turn it into the jewelry, bars, and coins with which we're all familiar. Milton Friedman. Uh, said, uh, and, and Warren Buffett likes to quote this, that mining gold is insane. You dig up the gold in one part of the, of the world, you transport it and bury it somewhere else in a different hole, and the, any Martian Washington's be scratching his head. Uh, of course, it's a little odd to say that an activity in which man has been engaged without interruption for four to 10,000 years uh, is insane. It seems a little far-fetched. People do do insane things for short periods of time, but not usually for 10,000 years. Gold is among the rarest of all the elements. It weighs 19 times more than water, and it's twice as heavy as lead, but it makes up only three parts per billion of the Earth's crust. That's the size of the challenge to find this most precious of metals. Since the dawn of civilization, mankind has been forced into ever more extraordinary lengths to extract gold from the Earth's crust. So let's take a look at the evolution of how gold has been mined over the last thousand years. The earliest gold was found in riverbeds as miners diverted streams to reveal the gold beneath. In fact, the ancient Greeks believed that gold was a combination of water and sunlight because it was found in rivers. Placer mining involved swirling water in circles in shallow metal pans with soil from the riverbed leaving gold as it was washed away. Back in 1200 BC, enterprising early miners would also use water power to propel gold-bearing sand over the hind of a sheep, which would trap the tiny but heavy flakes of gold when the fleece had absorbed all the water it could, the golden fleece would then be hung up to dry and beaten until all the gold had fallen off. Hence the legend of the golden fleece. A number of early civilizations used a variation of this technique called winnowing, in which soil was bounced on woolen blankets, allowing the wind to blow away the lighter sand and thus freeing the gold. Once the easily accessible gold on the surface had been collected, Prospectors needed to start thinking about how to work lower down. Beneath the Earth's crust they went, and this required miners to work together in larger groups as they started digging underground. Amazingly, underground mining dates back as far as the Romans. But the real challenge for gold miners was to move on from primitive methods of extracting gold from the soil to developing machines of increasing sophistication which allowed them to mine gold from the hard rock below the Earth's surface. The early days of quartz rock mining were relatively straightforward as far as the shallow deposits were concerned. But until the 1860s, the maximum depth miners could reach was around 300 feet. The sheer size and scale of the economic and geological challenges faced by early miners meant it would take many years of technological progress to enable deeper ore to be reached. Hard rock miners would sink shafts in order to extract gold from the quartz rock. Drilling was either done by hand or through the use of compressed air drills with the help of a little dynamite. Hydraulic drills were the next evolution, and these helped open up deeper holes in the Earth's surface, using drill bits which became longer and thinner the further they went down. Larger rocks extracted from the mines were crushed by heavy iron stamping machines to release the gold from the surrounding rock. Hydraulic mining used high-pressure jets of water to displace the rock and soil and open up the gold beneath. High in the hills, water was diverted into ditches and through heavy iron pipes. As the water channeled down, gravity increased its pressure, and as that pressure reached around 5,000 pounds per square inch, it was pushed through a small nozzle and used to blast the mountains apart. The displaced soil cascaded down the valley and into the sluices below, where it would be separated. This new mining technique, whilst productive, was not without cost, however, as diverting all that water caused huge flooding in the valleys below, devastating farmland. As a solution to this problem in California, miners turned to dredging, which worked like a vacuum cleaner, sucking up the material underwater and running it through a sluice to sift out the gold. 
Mining for gold has gotten increasingly difficult over the last 50 years, not just in finding the deposits themselves, but due to the increased social, political and environmental factors shaping the mining landscape. But how has that affected the way deposits are discovered and what are the added risks? Now that we're looking deeper and deeper into the earth, it's getting much more complex to find, uh, much more complex to recover metallurgy. And now we have to deal with issues to do with social situations, environmental situations. So the cost of finding these things has just gone up exponentially. And the difficulty is of finding a new deposit has as well. Back in the 80s, a new technology was developed in Nevada for heat sleep re reach recovery, which meant that you could take low-grade oxidized ore, and oxidized means basically the, the gold used to be in pyrite, iron, and it rusted. When it rusted, that turns the pyrite to rust, that liberates the gold. So you could, you sprinkle a cyanide solution on it, that dissolves the gold, and you could recover it. So that was a whole revolution. Well, we've gone through that. Those deposits are mostly gone now. Um, the next revolution in, in discovery was when the, the Iron Curtain fell and the whole world basically opened up to explorationists, geologists, and we could go to places and walk up to outcropping ore bodies that nobody had ever looked at. Satellite imagery came in and by different, different metals, different clays produce a different spectra. A light spectrum, and you could see that and process it, and then you could find areas of alteration, and you could go straight to that. So that was sort of the big revolution in the 90s. And subsequent to that, there's been no revolution. It's just gotten much, much harder to find these things. All the discoveries are happening deeper and deeper and deeper in the earth, and that brings a bunch of, a lot of, a lot of issues in terms of finding those things, because really we're looking blind. The truth is that the technology involved in finding gold has progressed the traditional methods of gold and the traditional deposit styles that we mined 200 years ago are tough to find because we already found them and mined them. But the industry is doing a reasonably good job of finding new deposits. The challenge is now is that the easy to find deposits are often found in political jurisdictions that strike the people that have the money to go find gold as being risky political jurisdictions. I find myself financing the exploration for gold in places like Congo, Sudan, Kyrgyzstan, Myanmar, Bolivia, places that most people normally wouldn't choose to go on vacation. That's their mistake, by the way. You know, people always say, well, mining is really risky because it's, it's really hard to find something. You know, the exploration phase is really risky. Only one out of a thousand prospects ever becomes a mine. So that's pretty risky. Uh, you know, it, it offers an awful lot of scope for shareholders to lose a ton of money. And so it gets known to be a very risky business. But believe me, when you're in the mining business, the risk begins when you find an economic deposit. Once, once you've found a deposit, what do you do? Well, you have to do a whole bunch of technical studies to make sure you can mine it and make money at it, make, make money. So it's actually ore, not waste. And that takes a lot of technical skills. You have to have geologists, engineers, metallurgists. You then have to have a whole bunch of lawyers making sure you've got your title right, you've got your surface rights, you've got your social license and all your, all your CSR people, your environmental studies. You've got to get all that right. You've got to get your permits. So you have, you have, you know, you have exploration risk, you have feasibility risk. Is this going to be feasible? You have price risk. I mean, the gold price can swing, or the silver price can swing, you know, 50% in a single year. I've seen it happen. I've seen it go, the gold price will go from 300 to 450 in a year. The silver price goes from $5 to $10 in a year. You can have the most brain, you know, genius level metallurgist in your company, and they can still get it wrong. You can use a new method, and it doesn't work on that particular ore. And finally, you can get in the ground. You can finally start digging it up. And guess what? All of your economic studies are based on drill holes. And the drill holes might be, you know, a couple hundred feet apart or they might be 30 feet apart. And then you have social risk. You've got to have your social license. Right now in the world, there's all sorts of places that do not want mining for whatever reason. They don't want mining for indigenous reasons having to do with the social nature of, of the tribal peoples in areas that, that have never had mining. They just simply don't want mining there. It happens in Canada. It happens in Brazil. Happens all, it happens in Africa, all over the world. Mines are where you find them. They're in great places and they're in terrible places. And you just have to take them where, where they are. It's a highly risky business. The first thing I do when I go to a new project is you, know, you pick up the rock, 
But what you really do is, is look around and say, okay, where am I? What's the infrastructure? What's it going to take to get in here to build, to build this thing? Is there a road? Is there power? Is there water? Is there a church sitting on top of the deposit? And these things cost hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. And on top of that, you're dealing with, okay, what's the political situation here? You know, we've seen just this year, Guatemala, Tanzania, the Philippines, and Indonesia throw taxes or pull mines or whatever on projects that were built or being built or operating. So that's a risk factor you've got to throw into it. Um, and then you're, you're predicting, as you know, your company, you're predicting, what's the gold or copper price going to be 10 years from now when this thing's operating? The risks involved in finding and building a gold mine are just the beginning. The risks of investing in junior mining companies are every bit as fraught for investors as those faced by the men and women trawling the Earth's crust in search of deposits. Mining companies need to make predictions about the costs of their mines, as well as the future value of the metal they'll eventually be able to pull from the ground. But investors not only have to evaluate these variables, but also make a calculated prediction about the ability of the company's management to successfully navigate the treacherous path from discovery to production. The chances of success are frighteningly low, and new deposits are proving increasingly difficult to find. When you're investing in junior exploration companies, my job is to find the fatal flaw as soon as possible. Newmont did a study a number of years back where they estimated that one in a thousand prospects turn into a mine of some sort, and a one in 10,000 turn into a tier one deposit. Now those odds sound really bad, and it's not that bad because it's easy to screen out the, the crap, but it's still really long odds. I mean, looking at gold, we as an industry produce about 90 million ounces a year. We haven't found 90 million ounces since 2006. Uh, right now we're averaging about 20 million ounces a year. So there's a real deficit because you look at their production profile and two, three, four, five years out, it drops off. But you got to consider it takes for a large deposit to be drilled out, studied, and built 10 to 20 years. So anything we find today, we've got to think 10 years down the road, more or less, it'll be in production. There's unpriced optionality there because there's going to be an M&A wave at some point. There has to be because the largest companies have been depleting reserves hand over fist and will have to come to the market to, to buy some of the sorts of names that we buy. You always buy a fund or an index. Do not buy an individual stock because the, the risk reward skew is completely wrong. It doesn't, there's no logic in doing that. You must buy, um, you must limit your downside risk by having an index, which will also maintain 75, 80% of your upside potential. So that's the, that's the first point. The second is to understand what is it that moves them. So while yes, there's an exploration phase where you can make 10 times your money if someone drills something out and it looks way bigger than people thought, that, that's fine. But for me, it's about, um, Gold and silver mining companies are mining margin. That's what they're doing. The fact that a lump of yellow metal can command a price of over $1,000 an ounce is a source of mystery to many people. But when you look at the cost of exploration, as well as the cost of the labor and energy which goes into extracting it from the ground, to say nothing of the taxes and the regulatory burden, it becomes much simpler to understand gold's value. But there is a point at which every deposit in the world becomes uneconomical to mine. And when that point is reached, the decisions that have to be made have far-reaching consequences. So there's an expression, mines die hard. They really are hard to kill. Uh, and they're hard to kill because when you have a mine that, let's just say, is losing money, that's, that's an economic reason to close a mine. You might have a thousand people whose livelihoods depend on running that mine. You have, um, you have, if it's an underground mine, you have a lot of maintenance costs to keep that mine going. If you close it, you have to dewater it constantly. You have to keep the power on. You have a lot of equipment you have to maintain. An open pit mine you can do less expensively, but it still does have care and maintenance costs. And sometimes those care and maintenance costs are way higher than running the mine at a loss for a period of time. So mines die hard. It takes a long time to close a mine, and most companies will, will end up losing money Money for a long time before they bite the bullet and say this is hopeless. Miners are very optimistic people as a rule. We're, we're, you know, we're born optimists, otherwise we wouldn't be in this business. While it may be true that every miner is a born optimist, this optimism and this willingness to go to dangerous places in search of untold riches 
is certainly not without its dark side. I mean, I've had cerebral malaria, I've had uh, toxoplasmosis, various parasites that have almost killed me. I've had helicopter crashes. I was in a plane crash that destroyed the plane and I had to climb out the window. Uh, I've fallen in crevasses. I've, I've, <laughs> I've been in riots. I almost was killed in Liberia in a, in a riot in Liberia. I've been tear gassed in Bolivia. God knows how many times. I mean, and of course, the, the real, car, you know what the real carnage is in the exploration industry? It's, it's cars. It's, it's, it's bad roads in bad places and people get in accidents in cars. And so how many, how many geologists that I know and actually have worked with in, in my company who've died in car crashes, I can count them on, on two hands, which is a lot. Three guys from my class have been shot in, in hot places. Uh, two of them were shot in, in getting out of a helicopter in the Philippines, in Mindanao. Uh, and one was killed in South America in a, in a, in a, you know, by bad guys. It's a very dangerous business, uh, but I love it so much that I embrace that kind of risk, and it's worked for me, and I'm still alive, and, and uh, so, you know, here we are. The challenges associated with finding and mining this strange yellow metal increase every year, and as the process has evolved over the last half century, mining company CEOs are finding those challenges harder and harder to solve. The mining industry has been a hard industry to operate in for the last 30 years. And the um, aura of respect surrounding mining is somewhere below that surrounding garbage collection. And the consequence of that is that many competent people would choose a job in any career other than mining. The people that you see in the executive ranks of mining companies are largely of my generation, which is to say old. While they have experience, we're beginning to lack legs in the industry. The biggest challenge I think that gold mining CEOs have today is that none of them that I've met, and I've met dozens or hundreds of them, really understand what gold is. Uh, they mine gold as if it were copper, as if it were tin, as if it were other things. Uh, and, and you should mine gold in a very different way because gold is a very different dynamic given its stock to flow uh, ratio. And given the fact people hoard gold, they don't uh, consume it. If you go back uh, before the 70s, uh, when people understood gold, uh, the impetus was to have your gold mine last as long as it could. Uh, and, and again, this, this is something that, that no mining CEO that I have ever come across understands and because they're trained to, to look at it as another commodity, and it isn't. And as a result, the total, entire gold mining industry uh, is, is, uh, is, is massively uh, uh, misallocates its, its capital. Well, let's say it's one gram per ton is equivalent basically to one part per million. So what we're saying is that with in a million grains of sand, one of those grains of sand is going to be gold. So it's not much, not much at all, uh, but that can make money. So that's sort of the scale we're looking at. And the, the complexities involved in figuring that out is unbelievable. Because consider, we're drilling a hole 300 meters down into an ore body, looking for an ore body. It's going to be you know, 100, 200 meters wide, et cetera. Your drill hole covers an area that big. You cut that in half crush that half of the core down, and then you extract a 30 gram sample. And that 30 gram sample, whatever that is, is meant to represent an area 25 by 25 by 25. So you can kind of see the complexity and issues we deal with here. Now, the first time I found a gold mine, I mean, a bunch of times I thought I did, but didn't, but the first time I actually did, I was working in Honduras. Uh, funded by some guy out of Australia and working on this conceptual idea of these hot springs that are forming gold deposits. So I went, you know, got the geologic maps, which were pretty poor. And in fact, at that point in Honduras, you could only get a map from the government and they cut all sorts of bits and pieces out of it. So it's really difficult. And what I, I saw on the map was La Tembladera, which is bubbling hot spring. So I went there and found a big outcrop of silicified brecciated sinter, which is hot springs deposit. And that never carried anything. It was much gold in that. Yet on the sides, on the fault, over here in this rock type, which is all to, all to hell, it, uh, I started picking up some good numbers, you know, seven, eight grams gold. You're like a detective. You're, you're trying to figure out what happened on this piece of ground a million, ten, a hundred million, you know, a billion years ago based on a little bit of data. So it's always fascinating to me just figuring that sort of thing out. And if you get it right, it's, 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 it's an incredible feeling like, wow, you know, I got it right, it's working. It doesn't happen that often, but as a geologist, 
I mean, that's what I love. It, you know, no matter where I go in the world, I've always got rocks to look at and think at, and I like that. Gold is unique amongst the elements in that it isn't consumed like, say, silver. Its value makes even the tiny amounts of gold used in things like electronics economical to recover. And this means that, importantly, just about every ounce of gold ever mined remains above ground. Gold is not consumed. Uh, all the gold ever mined in human history still exists above ground somewhere, uh, maybe buried in a pyramid perhaps, but available at the right price, uh, it comes back into the market. And what that means is that what gold mining does is it adds gold to the, an enormous gold uh, above ground supply uh, of the metal already. And so when we think about gold mining, uh, it's very unlike oil production or, or copper mining or iron ore mining, uh, because those commodities are consumed very shortly after they're mined, whereas gold is not. Now, gold production has actually increased significantly over the past 150 years uh, with the advent of new technologies uh, and, and new deposits that are found. But interestingly, if you look at uh, the percentage increase to the above ground supply, it's been fairly stable at between 1% and 3%. At the moment, the best, best guess is probably that there are 187,000 tons of gold. So this is all the gold that, that uh, ever was mined. Um, this is the stock, but you could also call it the inventory. Um, and then there's the flow. The flow is at the moment, I think in 2016, mine production was uh, 3,200 tons. So 187,000 tons of stock, 3,200 tons of flow. Um, if you divide that, you arrive at 58.8, I think. That's a stock to flow ratio. That means that um, uh, if, if you continue producing at the same rate, it would take 58 years to double the stock of 187,000 tons of gold. But that also means that the annual inflation of gold is 1.7%, which is pretty low. And I think it's interesting that um, population growth is also roughly 1.7%. Now, I think when it comes to, to money, um, trust and stability is crucial. If you compare it to fiat money inflation, since 1971, on average, the monetary base grew at 9% per year. Since 1913, it grew by 8% per year. So much, much more. If there would be a major supply disruption, in the copper space, or especially in the oil space, I mean, if, if they close down the, the Straits of, of Hormuz or, or whatever, um, oil supply would last for a couple of months and would have a huge impact on, gold pr uh, on, on oil prices. While for gold, if there's a big strike in, 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 in South Africa and mining production is, is down 10%, it doesn't have any impact on the, on the price of gold because of the stock, the existing gold, uh, is there, people trade with that existing gold, and, and at some price, every holder of gold will become a seller, and that's the beauty of it. And that is also, from my point of view, the reason why gold is that liquid. 20% of the world's finished gold products come from a single refinery in Switzerland. In the final part of our journey this episode, we want you to see firsthand this fascinating process to understand how the gold extracted from the ground is turned from a few flecks and a piece of rock to a finished gold bar. That what we are doing here um, is actually really very, very old techniques. You know? There has nothing dramatically new has been invented. Uh, all the, uh, the technology that we are using here is known for hundreds, uh, if not for thousand years. But of course, it has been refined in the meantime. Okay, we are now entering the, what we call the black foundry. Black because the material that we are processing here is still containing impurities. It's, it's mainly the dore coming from the mines. Yep. Uh, dore bar consists of uh, gold and silver and some impurities. Actually, we call dore already when it is uh, one or two percent containing gold, and the rest of it is mainly mainly silver. So this is high grade dore, and you see also here these these drill holes. Yep. They were made by the mine, by the producer, so they know what they are sending out. So we take these bars into our uh, refinery, as well as also uh, scrap, old jewelry, 
or uh, industrial scrap, uh, re refine it. That means we bring it up to a fineness of up to 99.99% pure gold. It's a normal procedure to speed up the melting process. Normally, normally we reach 250 degrees. We are ready to pour in 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Yeah. We take our samples always out of the liquid gold, liquid gold. because now only then you are sure that you have a representative sample. Now we take drillings here from this sample because this is representative for the whole melt. Yeah. And these samples then they go to our laboratory, to the laboratory of the customer, and one is kept aside in case of so this is the electrolytical refinery. These are, those are anodes we have uh, just made before. After that, we take these anodes inside each electrolytical plant. Inside the electrolytical plant, we have uh, uh, acid, current, and so we dissolve everything. Yeah. But with a particular uh, setting of current and voltage, and guarantee that only pure gold will be uh, attached the to the cathode. Yeah, exactly. This is the result of the electrolytical process for nine gold. So this is pure gold? Pure gold. When it is coming back from the refinery, it is the first step is we have to prepare the, the final bars. We have two melting pots. We are heating up in one pot and the other pot is pouring. And then it solidifies in, in this cube. We cut it now into pieces like this. And this is a little bit less than one kilo. Okay. Now we are going to what we call the white foundry. White because it is all pure high grade fine gold that, that is processed here. You see, here is this carousel where we load the blocks. Now a robot is taking one of the blocks and is adding a little piece on it. Our man can take the block with a little bit less than a kilo, some wire, melts it down. Uh, again here, you know, you, you, you have the flame when it is uh, solidified, so oxygen is burned away. He cools it down, puts it into water, and that is the, the final shiny part. On, on the other side, we, I can show you the 100 gram bars. 100 gram bars are produced fully by robots. And you remember, we had these blocks for the kilo bars. Yeah. Uh, this is now for 100 gram bars. So it's a little bit less than 100 gram. A robot is taking this block, putting it on a scale, adding some wire, but then you see there in the back, this furnace is, is a tunnel. Uh, I see, okay. So it is put on a conveyor belt, uh, the block with a little bit of wire, and the conveyor belt is moving it through this tunnel and when it comes out, it is a molten bar. Right. So we have, we're talking about a thousand of pieces per day. Thousand a day. Yeah. So this here is the last step in the production of uh, a bar. This is quality control. That means we are checking here by hand the weight of each bar. Right. If you want to do it precise, there is no other way. She takes every bar, puts it on the scale, and is checking the weight. At the end, this lady is the most important part, <laughs> because she is checking the bar. She's the last person who has it in her hands before it goes to the customer. You have two big issues. 
uh, in, in, in our business, in refining. One is precision, you have to be precise. Um, and the other thing is, you have to be fast. Because the value of gold, uh, a kilo, roughly $40,000, does not permit us to have this, this metal just laying around. So um, the whole production has to be meticulously planned. You know? So every step um, must be defined to the last, uh, I would say, al almost minute. Um, workers have to work hand in hand. Um, to make sure that the metal that comes in is as quickly through the process as, as possible. The process of finding, extracting and refining gold gives it not only its luster, but also much of its economic value. Today, with fiat currencies all around the world completely unhinged from any kind of a monetary anchor, gold's value has arguably never been higher. There's some magic about gold, and to some degree silver. There's some magic, it's the heft, it's the feel, it's the warmth, it's the color. It's just a beautiful thing and it always has been beautiful. And clearly it's the absolute core of the last, well, not just several hundred years of history, but probably thousands. This genuinely changes people's lives. There's more about gold than, than it's just like a shiny thing. Gold is really special. So now we have a better understanding as to why gold is money. And why, no matter what alternatives mankind dreams up over the centuries, we always return to this curious yellow metal. We've taken you underground to witness firsthand the enormous challenges that confront those who scour the globe looking for new deposits. And we've traced gold's path from a mere twinkle in a geologist's eye to the gold bars and coins that we know and recognize. As gold gets more difficult to find and more expensive to produce, the challenges facing those who spend their lives in search of this most precious of metals are constantly increasing. Since it was first discovered, gold has held a special place in the hearts and minds of man. For thousands of years, it's provided stability and a means by which wealth could be measured, preserved and protected for generations. It remains the only universally accepted currency and the only store of wealth impervious to government debasement. In the next episode, We'll examine the different attitudes towards gold in the East and the West. We'll explain how the gold price is different from the price of gold. And we'll take a look at how gold is bought and sold around the world. We'll also ask the question, is the price of gold manipulated? And if so, by whom? And we'll look at some of the many legends and conspiracy theories surrounding the oldest money on earth. Join me next time as our journey continues.